We discussed the first opening verses of Bhagavad Gita week before last. We went up through verse 11. Basically just setting the scene of, and we know in human society, there's always battle. There's a battle over this or that. There's always some confrontation. Generally speaking, especially in material existence, there's always a struggle. That's why this material world is, uh, is referred to the ocean of birth and death. There's always a struggle for existence here. The struggle is actually done on a day-to-day basis, although it's removed from our sight, generally speaking. None of us could survive a day without taking a life. Jiva, jiva, sajiva, nam. Every living entity, every soul, is referred to as jiva in the Vedic tradition. Jiva is a fragmental particle of the Supreme Lord. The Lord, of course, is all-encompassing, and we encompass a little body. And the body is not our self, but in material existence, we accept it as our self. The whole message of Bhagavad Gita is to take us to the platform of understanding our spiritual existence. But back to the jiva existing at the cost of another jiva. None of us can survive without eating, and... Everything we eat is at someone else's expense. And generally, everything we eat is at another living entity's life. Even the fruits and vegetables, those are living entities. Uh, Even the vegetarian doesn't get off without killing. (laughs) Uh, The killing is there. Now, there are some very rare yogic disciplines. Uh, Yogis that will only take milk. Well, milk is a natural gift of nature, and there's no death involved. But very few in human society exist on that platform. I guess if you were extremely strict yogi and wanted to live free of killing, you could live on milk, nuts, fruits. It's possible. But then again, you do have to walk on the earth from one place to another. And there's no place you can walk that you wouldn't be walking on some living entity. Even a small living entity is a living entity. So to move from one place to another. And none of us could live for 10 minutes without breathing. I don't know how long, what the current Guinness Book of World Records is on holding your breath or diving underwater. But there's yogis that actually can hold their breath for a considerable amount of time, but they basically shut their bodies down entirely, just turn off everything. But every time we take a breath, there's a life involved. There's living entities everywhere in the atmosphere. So at, at their expense, even in our breathing, there's death. So that the, this is the world, this is the material existence that we, we now are faced with, so there's a battle. We may not be on a battlefield, but we're certainly the microbes that we kill, the ants that we walk upon, the the fruits and vegetables that we may eat, uh, the grains that we eat. All of our existence comes at the expense of someone else. And in human society, we know that there's always confrontation. One party has something the other party wants. One party wants to dominate the other, either for their land or their resources. And throughout history, one battle and another battle is fought. This particular battle, battlefield of Kurukshetra, is not like those battles. In this battle, there is a party that is wanting to take over the reins of government, the reins, the administration, to put a, a, a righteous king in his place and to displace an unrighteous ruler who out to exploit the citizens. Again, we, it's hard for us. We don't have a frame of reference because at least now on this planet, practically every government lives at the expense of its citizens. There's very few governments on the face of the planet where they really are looking out for for the citizens. 
maybe there was a time even in this country where the general principle was the government was for the people and now the government is for the rich people. <laughs> Governments, when they get to a stage like that, we know in history time and again, material nature corrects the situation. So even you have a Roman Empire, which is a you know, great empire, it degrades and then there has to be a reckoning. This battle is, is a battle of reckoning where a rightful, righteous king is not in control of the government. He's not in his position. And he's been pushed aside by people that are, that are not looking out for the best interest of the citizens. And they're really, although the Vedic culture 5,000 years ago is so much more advanced than ours, even those people that are living with an exploitive motiva motivation, they really have, have a lot of good characteristics that we don't see in our current environment. So remember, this battlefield is at the end of the last age of man, 5,000 years ago. Four cycles of ages, Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwarpa Yuga, and Kali Yuga. So this battle is happening just, just at the end of Dwarpa Yuga and before Kali Yuga begins, 5,000 years ago. There's more character in the fabric of mankind at that time. And from there, it's all downhill. So we're on the downward spiral now in Kali Yuga. Very, very, very bad age for us. Governments, as I said, are exploitive. Uh, one man is out to exploit another man. One man is out to exploit a woman. I mean, it's just, there's a lack of much good to see in human society today. That isn't to say we don't have some nice philanthropic and altruistic organizations out there. We have our belly gates. I don't know if we have a Peace Corps anymore, but we have organizations like that. They, they, they look out. Uh, we have our Mother Teresa's and the people that come in at the wake of people. They, they want to take care of the suffering in humanity. Bhagavad Gita is, is much deeper than that. Bhagavad Gita means to get to the true, the true difficulty of existence. And that difficulty is not based on anything related to the body. The body is destined to die no matter what we do for it. We can save the, ch the starving children. We might be able to uh, make some modifications here and there. But ultimately, we're living in a land of death. If we can see that, we can begin to take interest in our spiritual life. If we think this is the land of milk and honey, then Bhagavad Gita is not a text for you. This text is for those that see the reality of our predicament. And the reality is we're living in a place that is entirely foreign to our true spiritual life. Entirely foreign. We're eternal. And this environment is in, ex is in opposition to our spiritual nature of our spiritual eternal existence. Our true nature is sat chit ananda, eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. This text is meant to bring us to that level of consciousness. The setting is not important. The fact that the Supreme Lord is personally present on a battlefield in this human society 5,000 years ago and giving instruction to his dear friend, Arjuna, is not the real significance of Bhagavad Gita. The real significance of Bhagavad Gita is Arjuna needs to see his situation in material existence. And we all have different situations. 
The instruction is the same for all of humanity, no matter what our situation is regarding our true spiritual existence. When the Lord instructs Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, we all benefit from those instructions, although I doubt any of us in this room are warriors. Arjuna was a warrior. So you could say, well, if Arjuna is a warrior, he's getting instruction. I'm not a warrior, so I don't need Bhagavad Gita. It doesn't matter. Because the setting of Bhagavad Gita is simply a stage upon which the Lord can deliver pure transcendental knowledge. So the verses we're going to read tonight are, re are in regards to seeing the difference between what is material and what is spiritual. So there's two opposing armies. And one army is properly situated in that they, they are detached from the result. They are detached from the material objective. In fact, Arjuna becomes so detached from the material exact objective of the war that the Lord himself chastises him and has to correct him. But let's read some verses and put it in perspective. Week before last, in discussing the opening verses and setting the scene, we have Dhritarashtra, who is a blind king. And the blind king is sitting in his castle, and he has his minister there, Sanjaya. And Sanjaya, well, Sanjaya has been blessed by his spiritual master, and he has... One of his blessings is he can perceive what's happening outside of his sensual perception. What I mean by that is he can know what's happening in a battlefield miles away, and he can also know the minds of the people on that battlefield. And with that mystic opulence, which his guru has granted him, He's able to relate to the blind king what's happening. The blind king is truly the instigator of this battle. His motivation is he wants his son to become the ruler of the world, although he's not the rightful heir to the throne. And he's not the rightful heir in a couple ways. He's not the rightful heir legally, but he's also not the rightful heir because he has no, he doesn't have the proper qualities and character to do the best for the citizens of the kingdom. So we open with the scene where the king is requesting his servant, his minister, Sanjaya, tell me what's happening. And the king's a little concerned. He's afraid that the battle may not be, go on. He's afraid that there might... Why? Because it's a place of... It's a religious site. It's a holy ground that they're going to fight on. And he's thinking, this holy site is so spiritually powerful. We are aware of this. Even today, we see different cultures and different religions. When they go to their religious holy places, you know, Mecca or other places like that, depending on the religious tradition, these really have a spiritual influence when you, when you visit these places. They truly affect the heart. So he's afraid that this religious place is going to adversely affect his sons to the extent that they'll just want to make peace. So he questions, please tell me, what's happening on this battlefield? And Sanjaya relates it, and he tells the king, tells the king that your son is there, he's assessing the situation. So week before last, we went over the verses where his son, Duryodhan, is talking to the, the commander-in-chief. So Duryodhan is, is the king's son, he's the prince, and <clears throat> he's going to the, to the head military man and saying, Okay, here's, here's how everything's like this. All, the, all of the soldiers are there. And he's a little 
The situation with his commander is a little unique. His commander-in-chief is a man of character. How much character? So much character that when his opponent earlier in life was granted a great boon, a benediction, that his son would be able to kill him. Do Are you following? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Dronacharya, the commander-in-chief, he was earlier, he had a confrontation. The gentleman he had a confrontation with was given a boon that his son would be able to kill Dronacharya. After the child was born, the best military teacher around was Dronacharya. And the gentleman went and he said, here's my son, will you train him how to be a warrior? He knows this boy can kill him, but still he trains him. Who would do that? A man of character. This is my duty. I'm a teacher. He wants to learn the science and the art of war. I'll teach him the art of war. Even if there's a chance later in life he'll use that art of war against me. Duryodhana is using that as leverage to instigate anger in his commander-in-chief. He's afraid his commander-in-chief, he's afraid for one reason that this is your student. And in fact, all most of the military participants on the battlefield on both sides were the student of Dronacharya. So he's a little concerned that, that he'll, he won't do his job properly. So he very diplomatically tries to stir up his anger by saying, this boy can kill you. You need to be careful. And he ends all this diplomacy. He ends the diplomacy basically saying, at the least, we all have to protect Grandfather Bhishma. Grandfather Bhishma is a great warrior, a Maharata. We can't conceive of such warriors as this. They can themselves fight with 10,000 warriors. Different age of men. We talked about this week before last. Completely different age. They have a, they had atomic weapons that at that time that were controlled by mantra. These were great mystic warriors controlled by mantra. Their atomic weapon, when they shot it, it only killed the person it was going at. It didn't blow up a whole city and kill thousands of innocent women and children. It killed that one person. They had great mystic opulence. It's hard for us to conceive of it. As we discussed, it's important for us to understand that this battlefield scene is a true event in history. A lot of scholars will look to Bhagavad Gita and they will praise its spiritual significance and the uniqueness of the instruction, but they'll explain the battlefield and everything else in an allegorical way. This means that, and that means this, and no, this really happened. So we're going to take off with text 12 this evening. Duryodhana has spoken his piece, and now we're going to have a vision of the, what's happening on the other side. This is all preliminary to the battle. In fact, the whole Bhagavad Gita is spoken before the battle begins. So Bhishma, Grandfather Bhishma, has just been praised. We always know what generally happens before a battle. To get every, everybody fired up, there's a lot of noise. I don't think they do that much today. They just start shooting. But... No, they do. They go like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not like this, though. No, not like that. And not it's like I was gonna. What I was going to mention is we've seen movies, you know, where they, we see this. Brave. This push a button. Huh? Braveheart. Braveheart. There you go. Yeah. Basically, that's what they're doing here. We're gonna read a little, a little bit about the 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 chest pounding to to rile up the rile up the forces, and it starts. In verse 12, then Bhishma, the great valiant grandsire of the Kuru dynasty, the grandfather of the fighters, blew his conch shell very loudly, making a sound like the roar of a lion, giving Duryodhana joy. 
After that, the conch shells, drums, bugles, trumpets, and horns were all suddenly sounded, and the combined sound was tumultuous. On the other side, both Lord Krishna and Arjuna, stationed on a great chariot drawn by white horses, sounded their transcendental conch shells. Whoa. <laughs> Little difference there. Bhishma, he had a grand sound with his conch shells, but this word is not there. Divyao. On the other side, both Lord Krishna and Arjuna, stationed on a great chariot drawn by white horses, sounded their transcendental conch shells. Divya. Transcendental. What's this word mean? What's the significance of their, this transcendental conch shell? Why is it distinguished as such? First of all, it's understood that even though the Supreme Lord may come into this realm of birth and death, he's not affected by it. Although we're affected by the slings and arrows of our outrageous karma to suffer or enjoy according to our prior activities, although we're subjected to that day in and day out, some days are good, some days are bad. Some months good, some months bad. Some lives are good, some lives are bad. And again, we go through cycle of samsara, one birth to the next birth. When the Supreme Lord comes into this realm of existence for our benefit, he remains transcendental, unaffected by his external potency. He's not affected the way we are. The whole objective of Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Lord is trying to bring us to that platform of not being subjected to the pains of material existence. Both Krishna and Arjuna, both of their conch shells are designated as transcendental. Now I can understand God's bugle would be transcendental because he's God. But what about Arjuna? What makes Arjuna's conch shell transcendental? It's where he got the conch shell. That's one thing. And the other thing is, yes, he is a transcendentalist. But there's a unique quality of a transcendentalist. The devotee of the Lord never sees himself as transcendental. He always sees himself as the most fallen. But that's his qualification for his spirituality. That's what keeps him head and shoulders above the rest <laughs> in material existence. Both conch shells are transcendental because one is being blown by the Lord himself and the other is being blown by the Lord's pure devotee. And the unique characteristic of someone who has dedicated heart and soul to only wanting to have a loving exchange with God the unique characteristic of that individual is they enjoy an experience just like the Supreme <laughs> Lord. That has to be our objective, to get on that platform, to get free of, of this cycle of birth and death. A little bit of the poor port, or the whole poor port, why not? I was going to read the next poor port, but we'll read this one. In contrast with the conch shell blown by Bhishma Dave. The conch, shell, conch shells in the hands of Krishna and Arjuna are described as transcendental. The sounding of the transcendental conch shells indicated that there was no hope of victory on the other side because Krishna was on the side of the Pandavas. Jayastu Pandupotranam Yesam Pakse Janardana. Victory is always with persons like the sons of Pandu because Lord Krishna is associated with them. Whenever and wherever the Lord is present, the goddess of fortune is also there, because the goddess of fortune never lives alone without her husband. Therefore, victory and fortune were awaiting Arjuna, as indicated by the transcendental sound produced by the conch shell of Vishnu, or Lord Krishna. Besides that, the chariot on which both the friends were seated had been do donated by Agni, the fire god, to Arjuna, and this indicated that this chariot was capable of conquering all sides. 
wherever it was drawn over the three worlds. Well, I have a question. Why is Krishna helping one side and in opposition to another? Isn't God for all? I just have an answer that I was told at one point by somebody, but um, <laughs> wasn't Arjuna given the option of, hit, of Krishna's army or Krishna himself only as an advisor? Mm -hmm. okay. Does that answer my question? Um, not. <laughs> no, Christian, he didn't. Yeah, Judah didn't give the option. Yeah. Yoda got the option. Oh, okay. I just knew that someone got yes. the option. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I read somewhere where Ar Arjuna, or, 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 you know, he was already. He came with Krishna. They came together to this to this world. To this plane. To this plane. Yes. They came together. But that's on a much more, that's a more esoteric subject matter. Well, this is my question. My question is, if God is the God of every living entity, why in this situation is God helping Arjuna and not helping Duryodhana? Because it's what's Everyone in the battle that died attained salvation. He helps well, them. Okay, that's one perspective. It kind of answers. Or just because it's the right, I mean, it's the way it's supposed to end, I guess. Um, the, right, the right people end up in good order. Mm. Is he trying to cl uh, create a new beginning or a clean start? What does it mean, God? My question is, basically, very simple. Is God partial? Is he partial? Is he partial to one side and against another side? He appeared partial because of the material energy and it's our being in delusion that he appears partial. The sun is covered by clouds, but the sun's still bright. It's just our vision that can't see it, our perspective. That's a good, we're going in the right direction. Well, or if it just comes down to it, if, if, I mean, if it carries out everyone involved's karma the way it's supposed to be, it would seem that God would favor one person's life over another, but you're... But it's not true. I mean, it's right? Just, yes. It's supposed to happen. That's correct. We can understand that in, within material nature, everything works out perfectly. Exactly. Yeah. However, we are in illusion where we not be able. To, we may not be able to perceive that everything's working out. Yes, ma'am. He wants to deliver the pious and annihilate the miscreants. That's getting closer. Yes. The rain rains yeah. on the rock as equally as on the earth, but the earth accepts. Is in a position to accept the rain. Yes. But the rocks aren't. Yes. So, the same way. so there's where we're at. That's where we're <laughs> at. Let's explain that. And let's put that in perspective. There's truly no partiality on this. God is not partial. He's equal to everyone. But he does say in Bhagavad Gita, Ye yata mam prapajyante. Ye yata mam prapajyante. All of them as they surrender unto me reward accordingly. It is not partiality. It's a matter of taking advantage of a loving parent. Is it not? If we have a loving parent, he may have two offspring. If one offspring refuses to have anything to do with the parent, turns their back and runs away from home, and the other child stays with the father, educated and loved and nurtured and given all facility. Is it the fault of the parent that the other child ran away? We have our independent, we have our little infinitesimal bit of freedom here. And we can choose how to conduct our affairs. So we're, we're seeing here that Arjuna seems to be the favored, and Duryodhana seems to be on the other side. But factually, <laughs> the Supreme Lord's on everybody's side. He's on all our sides. We can either take advantage of his benedictions or not. That's our free will. Well, why do I have free will then? What kind of a God would give me free will where I could make the wrong choice? Merciful. That's mercy? Well, it allows us to uh, learn from our own mistakes if we fall down on our faces. 
That's a good way to teach somebody, yeah. (laughs) Since touching the uh, the fire, you know. Once we get burnt once, we're not going to do it again. Okay. So that's that's a good thing. Uh, Pretty. The last person won't do it again. (laughs) So, yes. Yes? I uh, I mean, a loving God would, I mean, just, I don't know, did not force it. What's love mean? (laughs) <laughs> That's what it is. What's love me? I mean, it, it, it depends on. I mean, no. I want to know. Putting some. I want to know what putting, love is. <laughs> <laughs> huh? No, but I mean, to me, it would be putting, putting, something else before oneself. I mean, it, whatever the object being loved is. Let's go a little deeper. <laughs> love is simply this. Love means free will. Without free will, what is the question of love? If I don't have a choice yeah, in the exactly. matter, right? That, that's if I don't have a choice in the matter, how can I, how can we call it love? It's slavery. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So if God's calling all the shots and he's whipping me into shape, as you said, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's for your own good. It's for your own good. Even though God knows what is, even though God knows what is best for you, He loves you enough to let you decide that for yourself. He gives you enough rope, exactly, to hang yourself with. So that's there. We have our choice. We have our free will. Arjuna has chosen. He's made his choice. His situation, he's on the side of Krishna. He's fully surrendered to Krishna. My dear Lord, from this day forward, whatever you want, I go along with that. And unfortunately for the other side in this particular battle, most of those, I mean, there are devotees on both sides, but most, the overall leadership is, is not headed in a godly direction. We have transcendental conch shells, and we know why they're transcendental, because both the Lord and his pure devotee who's acting on his behalf are truly on the same platform. Now, I know in in Christianity, they say that Jesus is is God. Of course, Jesus said he was the son of God. Well, both statements are correct. Why? Because the objective is the same. Even if Jesus is or isn't the supreme Lord... If he's God or he's the son of God, because their objective is the same, the result of his association will be the same, no matter what his position. And if you really study the mysticism of Christianity, you'll come away with that understanding. Similarly, that's why Arjuna's conch shell is transcendental. He's fully surrendered to the Supreme Lord. So his involvement on this plane of existence is not exploitive. His plane, his existence here is completely in service. That's our choice. We can live on this plane either in an exploitive mentality or in a service mentality. Lord Krishna blew his cock shell called Pachajanya, Arjuna blew his, the Devadatta and Bhima, performer of Herculean tasks, blew his terrific conch shell called Pundra. King Yudhisthira, the son of Kunti, blew his conch shell, the Ananta Vijaya, and Nakula and Sahadev blew the Sugosha and Mani Pushpaka. That great archer, the king of Kasi, the great fighter, Sikandi, Dristadyumna, Virata, the unconquerable Satyaki, Drupada, the sons of Drupadi, and the others, O king, such as the mighty armed son of Subhadra, all blew their respective conch shells. At that time, Arjuna, the son of Pandu, seated in the chariot bearing the flag marked with Hanuman, took up his bow and prepared to shoot his arrows. O king, after looking at the sons of Dhritarashtra drawn in military array, Arjuna then spoke to Lord Krishna these words. 
Arjuna said, O infallible one, please draw my chariot between the two armies so that I may see those present here who desire to fight and with whom I must contend in this great trial of arms. There's some great significance to the fact that the fighters on, on the side of Arjuna, the Pandavas, because they're all situated transcendentally, because they're all fully surrendered to the Supreme Lord, actually from a military view, viewpoint, the battle was kind of stacked against them. Because of their transcendental position, they had every advantage. Not only do they have transcendental conch shells, but they themselves are in a transcendental position. What's that mean to us, that they're situated in a transcendental position? That's core to an understanding of, of Bhagavad Gita, is situating oneself in a transcendental position. In life, that's our choice at every moment. We have this freedom to choose whether to be in the transcendental position or whether we conduct our affairs in the position of exploitation. It's important for us to see it in a proper perspective. And that's why the setting, although we mentioned earlier, it's not truly significant to the overall message of Bhagavad Gita. It's significant to Arjuna as the recipient of the knowledge. Because Krishna takes on the position of teacher, of guru, in this great text. And in taking on that position of teacher, he gives specific instruction to Arjuna according to Arjuna's position. Arjuna's a warrior. And as we're going to find out, Arjuna becomes bewildered for our benefit. Arjuna is on the transcendental position. The devotees of the Lord who are truly, fully surrendered to God don't generally become bewildered in this the material existence the way we do. Does that make sense? We become bewildered here. Things get the best of us because our consciousness is covered over as we chant every week. We take to the process of Krishna consciousness. Why? Because we need to cleanse our consciousness. We have to come to the spiritual platform of consciousness. And we first have to see how the living entities, and particularly human society, how the consciousness is affected by association and circumstance. And throughout Bhagavad Gita, we're given much instruction where it's explained that within this plane of existence, there's three levels, three general levels of influence upon us. The mode of goodness, the mode of passion, and the mode of ignorance. And we have to see how that external energy of the Lord's in this material world affects the way we conduct our affairs. Once we begin to see that everything that we experience in this material plane of existence under the influence of these three forces, these three energies of the Lord's material creation, goodness, passion, and ignorance, Ignorance. Once we begin to see how they influence people, then we can begin to understand the science of self-realization whereby our consciousness can be raised out of the material realm and into the spiritual realm so that our conch shells become transcendental. What I mean by that is everything we do becomes surcharged with spirituality. Even though it may appear the same. Grandfather Bhishma also blew his conch shell, but it was not designated as transcendental. Arjuna's was. Our activities on this plane of existence may seem the same as anybody else's. 
But there is a world of difference depending on the intent of what we're doing. Our intent can either be exploitation or spiritual surrender. The activity may appear exactly the same. So let's just take a minute before we close this evening and look at consciousness and look at Let's look at human society very quickly. Try to get a grasp of the different levels of consciousness and how people are affected. Mode of ignorance. I'm sure that most of you don't have much experience. You just had experience of that, though. You went to Las Vegas. (laughs) And what's the nature of, of people that are there? When they're there, they're influenced by what? Slot machines. (laughs) <laughs> gambling <laughs> sex every show alcohol. generally and alcohol wow and what do they eat for dinner all you can eat buffets uh huh right all, you, all the animals you can eat buffets in that environment imagine the consciousness when you're intoxicated if you're a sober person and you walk into a bar at one in the morning I don't know if any of you have done this. We'll just imagine this, okay? Yeah, we sell plenty of drunks. Yeah. But just imagine you walk into a bar at one in the morning or two, and you look at the people and you haven't had a drink. What's it look like to you? (laughs) Dirty. Very dirty. They're sad. Very dirty. They look very stupid. Dumb. Ignorant. Oh, what? Mode of ignorance. They look ignorant. Why? Ah, oh, here's a bunch of men throwing themselves all over women, women throwing so they don't even know these people. They're not you know, it's just they're gonna jump in a car and they're gonna drive into another car and they'll never make it home, they'll get arrested for a deal. Who knows? But it's just it's nothing nothing good is on the horizon. And even if they make it home, what's the next morning like? Oh my god. Do I have to get out? Why turn the sun off? <laughs> How's it look to you when you walk in the bar? Because you're not drunk, you see a difference in consciousness. You can directly perceive it. It's not difficult, is it? Ignorance and your level of consciousness. There's a distinction. Whether it be the intoxication of liquor, the intoxication of sex life, a nightclub... So many intoxications are there for us where we can turn off everything and become fools, become ignorant. We can see the difference in that consciousness than our consciousness. What about the mode of passion? Go to New York City, walk down the street. The people are so wrapped up in their personal helter-skelter, work, work, make, make money. They're so wrapped up in that, a person can be lying, dying, and they won't even stop. The majority just walk on by. What kind of consciousness would let you, in seeing another person suffering in agony, but you're so wrapped in your materialistic Gimme, gimme, gimme consciousness, you would just walk on by. Now, when the farmers, when the people that don't live in that environment day in and day out go into the city and see that, what do they see? What's their experience? They're appalled. My God, stop. Help this person. Somebody. Difference in consciousness. Somebody's coming from outside. He's seeing the mode of passion. And he's saying, stop. What's well, a little bit better than the ignorance where those people, were, they're destined to suffer because of their activities. The drunks are going to suffer. The sex mongers are going to suffer. People with the mode of goodness. The intellectuals. The people that are trying to, to do gooders. I do mean that in a negative way. Why would I mean it in a negative way? Because they're doing good is not ultimate good. It's good. It's good. It's great to try to feed the hungry. It's great to try to save the, save the distressed. 
But ultimately, they're not giving an ultimate solution. Okay, so you take that unfortunate person who is dying of, of, of some disease, you, you curtail the disease, you put them in a good situation, they get a good education, they live a great and fruitful life, and what's at the, what waits them at the end of that life? What have you done? You put a band-aid on a situation. It's a nice band-aid. It feels good. Gave them a nice life. But that's not what the sages and the saints and the transcendentalists strive for. They're striving to give a permanent solution. So even those in the mode of goodness as seen by the transcendentalists the true spiritualists of the world, they even see. Of course, they see the mode of ignorance. They see the mode of passion. But they also see the mode of goodness is ultimately not of any true, sustainable, lasting value. Spirituality means permanent solution. Satchitananda. Now, what if you can give somebody that? Eternal existence, no more birth and death, full knowledge of everything material and everything spiritual and unending pleasure that's ever increasing. Now that's a solution. That's Bhagavad Gita. That's why we come here every week and we meet together and we chant Hare Krishna day in and day out to purify our consciousness so we can see what is matter and what is spirit. So we can perceive what is for our true benefit and what is, although nice, who's going to deny it? It's nice to have comfortable life. It's nice to elevate yourself, to live for thousands of years in one body. That's available in, in this material universe. But it's not Krishna's, it's not the Lord's perspective. What's he say about it? Abrama Bhuvana Loka. Abrama. Brahma. Brahma's planet, the topmost planet. From the topmost planet, Abrama Bhuvana Loka. From the highest planet to the lowest planet. Every, every place in this material world is miserable. Ultimately, wow. This text is meant to bring us beyond that misery. Permanently. A permanent solution. That's why in the introduction, Bhaktivedanta Swami makes it very clear, if there is going to be one religion, if there's going to be one, one spiritual text, let it be that text, let it be that, that practice of spiritual discipline that allows us to completely purify our consciousness and end once and for all all the miseries of material existence. Not that we simply go to our place of worship and do some business with God so that we can have a better situation in a land of misery. That's no, that's not true spirituality. It may be a good religion, may be a good business deal, but it will not make us permanently happy. Any questions? What, we're all in agreement? Right. You know, looking for money or what they're going to just turn around and spend on more alcohol. Right. Um, how do you help them? Like, if you can teach them to be more spiritual, I mean, other than, like, what if you can get them in a better place and then try to teach them a spiritual life? Mm -hmm. the whole, if you is, can. Is it necessary to regulate the poor? Regulate. Through the state to, uh, to get them to a better place? Yes. Place. The whole program of spiritual culture, as Krishna outlines in Bhagavad Gita, the whole system of Varnashram Dharma, 
he, he explains there are four classes of men and four stations in life, four stages of life, is to gradually uplift everyone to the spiritual platform. You're not going to take the someone completely immersed in the mode of ignorance and put them into a class here yeah, no, <laughs> and have them silly. comprehend yeah. this level of spiritual discourse. It's like baby steps. Right. Try to help. So how do we? I don't know how to help those right. people that were. How do we so help them? <laughs> At least we know from our teachers that that our our best discipline for help is public sank kirtan, like we come here and we mm -hmm. we have kirtan. Devotees also go out into public and just chant on the streets, mm -hmm. although not happening so much in this country now. It's happening in Europe, big time in Europe, India. It's something that needs to be, and it does happen here. It's not that it doesn't happen. There are there are festivals all the time. Just hearing the transcendental sounds plants the seed in the consciousness that takes it gradually to a platform of desiring upliftment, unbeknownst even to them. Also, we try to we try to give people transcendental foodstuffs. Again, on the spiritual platform, just by eating, that that has an it's yeah. it has a therapeutic effect. We distribute literatures profusely into society, and we could tell you so many stories. 